Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the LFC Transfer Room. My name is Lewis, and we're back with another episode of Expert Analysis, the series where we bring on football content's top creators and just fans of general clubs to get their thoughts on all things current day and past. And today I'm joined by the man who's bringing retro back. He's a man who he knows his music as well as his kits, and he's the man who's currently working on the Patrick Berger YouTube channel. If you haven't go to subscribe to it, make sure you do. The content is top quality. And if you haven't go to, saw it already, go check out the story of a crew it's on redmantv.com i've watched it recently it's fantastic if you want to know all the history of the shirt from liverpool from 1996 make sure you go check it out and it is of course jay pearson aka jimmy cully on twitter jay how you doing man what an intro that was pal i'd say you know when you when you started saying football experts i'm like they've got the wrong guy i'm definitely not one of them but uh boss mate yeah, mate, I'll take it all day. To, to be fair, mate, honestly, we've we've done quite a few shows together on other platforms, haven't we, and stuff mm. like that. So it's it's nice for the two of us to to come on here, man. So uh, you know, love what LFC transfer room are doing, mate. So uh, yeah, appreciate it, mate. I can say that, man. I mean, we're always trying to. We're not quite up to Red Men's daily schedule, but you know what? We move, we do what we do, and it's always nice to get guests on who actually fans of Liverpool we get whoever we can on anyone to discuss any topics around Liverpool and if you are new around here please make sure to hit like and subscribe we're over 10,000 now but we want to keep that going yeah all helps out guys so I want to start off then obviously the big elephant in the room you're working with Patrick Berger I mean I know he's a hero of yours I know he's someone who you've idolized since you were younger just how surreal is that to be working alongside someone like that Oh, mate, it's 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 bananas, really. Do you know what I mean? I think um, if you'd have said, like, I remember being eleven years of age and going to Anfield and buying the crew shirt. You know, the sort of like the week it came out. You know, you get a good school report at the end of the summer and you got a new football kit. That's how my family works. So we uh, we went to Anfield and got Burger Fifteen on the back of the crew shirt. If you'd said to me then, you know, in twenty odd years' time, when you're thirty eight years of age, you're going to be, you know, getting drunk in th- for three days in Prague and um, you know, spending all your time with Patrick Bergman being in his house and doing his YouTube channel and stuff. And I've become like, yeah, all right, mate, get, get a grip. You know, and it's never happening. But so it's quite surreal, mate. You know, they always, a lot of people always say never meet your heroes because it can always be a negative thing, but it's been the complete opposite. You know, it's um, it's weird now because now I've known him for a, a good number of years. It, it's weird to to see him as Patrick Berger, the footballer. Now I see him as just me, mate. And it's it's, it's lovely because he's a lovely fella. You know, his family's amazing and dead accommodating. And he's, you know, uh, me and his son just have daily banter now. It's just, it, it's great. So, yeah, it's it's very surreal, mate. It is it is very surreal. But, um, you know, something that I'm I'm, I'm cherishing because, you, you know, there's it, there's a lot of things that happen in this content creation world. And when you get opportunities like this, you've, you you can't really say no to it. Do you know what I mean? I mean, like, like as a business owner myself trying to make it, um, these are the type of things that you've you've got to uh, sort of grab with two hands, really. So it's um, yeah, it's it's surreal. It is surreal. I mean, it's it must be nice seeing like like you said, then it's Patrick Berger, the footballer. But it must be nice to sort of see the human element of him that maybe back in back in those days when it was Patrick Berger's time around the nineties, the early two thousands, like we didn't get to see as in depth from people as we do now. I mean, was it a bit of a surprise for you that he was so accommodating, so? just similar to yourself in many ways um it's a good question because i think you know when you follow footballers on it on on social media and stuff like that you get you know sort of the the picture if you like of of, of who they are as people because they depends on how open they are with, the, with their lives and and paddy's really good with, with that on his instagram he's really good on instagram because he's constantly traveling um and he's you know living living his best life as as the young ones say um and he is he's, he's doing that you know his family a boss and they just want to spend all the time in the world together but he's always been like that he's always been a family man he's never been sort of like a, a flash footballer that type of thing he just sort of did his job and went home that type of thing and yeah he is he's, he, you know so i had a sort of a an idea of how sound he was anyway um but it was wasn't until obviously i first interviewed him years ago for the cop Out podcast that um it sort of spiraled into that really because it was a, a Basically, how it all started was I was on, I was furloughed from work and, you know, you're bored on YouTube and stuff like that. My son's like having a nap and I thought, do you know what? I wonder if there's a Patrick Berger documentary I can watch because you're watching loads of content. And there wasn't one. And I was like, that's a bit strange. So I went, do you know what? I'm going to make it. And I thought, I'll have a go. And that was it, really. I made it. And then within six weeks of it being released, his son had seen it and said, you know, it was boss and I'm going to get my dad to watch it. I'm like, what? And then two weeks later, I got a DM off Paddy, and that was it. The, it just spiraled from there. So, I mean, it's mental how quick that sort of 
escalates from simply I'm bored. I want to do something to your meeting, your hero. And it's a testament to the sort of, I suppose, your creativity as a creator. Because like I said, watching the story of a crew, when I went into it, I was thinking, you know, it's going to be like a sort of fan documentary. It's going to be, it'll be good, but it, you know, like a certain level of creativity and budget to it. It's top quality. And like watching the whole thing from start to finish, you realize how much effort you're putting into these products. And I see that on the Patrick Berger channel. So is there any sort of like, have you got any creative influence from anyone with regards to the content that you create? Um, I suppose, I mean, again, for, to start, Lee, thanks very much for for, for watching it. And it, it was a labor of love. Um, it was pretty co heavy COVID restricted um, when I was doing it because obviously I couldn't go out and, and visit the people that I was interviewing and because of restrictions and stuff. So it was done via Zoom. I am sort of working on, a new version of it to be honest where you know it's face to face so you know there might be a story of a crew 2.0 at some point um, but it, it went from being this kit that I've been obsessed with since I was a kid and the training kit to like it just went I just wanted to know why a crew why was it called that why was it why cream and all that sort of and it just went from being a 15 minute 20 minute thing that I thought I'd make into this hour-long film where it wasn't just about a kit, it was about the culture in the city of Liverpool and what Reebok had done to tap into it as a new player in the game, as a kit manufacturer. So it was that story as well. And I, I get it when people, some some people have said on social media, like, who the F would want to watch a, a film about a kit? And it's, you know, the comments are great. And I love that. And I say, listen, it, it goes a lot deeper than that. And it's about how, you know, Liverpool was the epicentre of, of fashion and we sort of set the trends and stuff. So it goes a lot deeper than that, mate. So, so yeah, it was, um, it was a true labor of love. And in terms of influence, mate, I think it's just the community that we're in. There's so many amazing graphic designers. And since I've been in the sort of Liverpool Twitter scene, if you like, I've known a lot of co these content creators and I see them. And obviously I've worked quite closely with Red Men um, over the years and stuff. So their creativity is, is second to none in terms of what they do. So I've taken a lot of influence from those guys and, when I was making the Accru documentary, you know, um, Tom Dutton, especially, he, you know, was one of the the, the, the producers at Red Men. Um, he was just influential in terms of giving me advice and stuff, and he was brilliant. And it just stems from that, really. And it's just, it's just trying your luck, you know what I mean? I mean, I used to work for Apple, so I had a lot of creative influence there when you see people, what they're doing on, on Final Cut. And, you know, I started on iMovie and, you know, went, you know, upgraded to Final Cut. And then I, you just, it's just practice, mate, you know. But if you... you you think you've got this idea in my head. I want to create it. So I'll find out how I can do it. I'll ask around or I'll go on a YouTube video and, and see what I can do. And it's just trial and error. I mean, the Patrick Berger documentary I made, I've now took it down because I, I'm embarrassed by it. I think I can do a lot better. And I am working on another version of it. But now I have the connection to him personally. You know, I've, you know, the, his connections of his career and stuff. So it can be upgraded. So it's just trial and error, mate. You know, and at the end of the day, I wouldn't be where I am right now if I didn't work with Mick Moran at the the, the Copite podcast, you know, because he asked me to to start doing the Copite podcast with him. Ages ago, I started writing and that's how it started. And between the two of us, we were learning as we go. You know, we started the Copite podcast. We, we, we built it into a YouTube channel. And now Mick's doing really, really well with the audio side of things. And it's it just stems from there, mate. It's just, it's just trial and error, mate. And in terms of my creative influence, I just... Like, I'm obsessed with retro, like you said at the beginning, and I love the 90s and stuff like that. And I think there's not enough of that around at the minute in terms of content. So I think I found my niche in terms of doing stuff. Um, I did a documentary for the Red Men on, at Christmas, and it was like the 50 greatest Liverpool signings. Right. Um, and I just made it in VHS and retro, and someone messaged me saying, it's got your stamp all over that. It's got your blueprint all And I, I thought, I'll take that. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it, it's it's not done on my own, mate. There's so many people that have helped me over the years. It's, it's unreal. Well, it's a very, you mentioned that it is a very tight knit community and there's a sort of a willingness from everyone to like, I, when I reached out to Chris and said, you know, do you want to do this? There was no hesitation. He was just, yeah, I'll do it. Everyone's so cooperative in this scene and especially in the Liverpool side of things. Where did you start to, wh when did the Red Men sort of journey begin for you? Because you've been around them for a good few years now. Was it that you had relationships prior to it or was it sort of the way I did where I just reached out to them and, got lucky enough that Steve emailed me back saying, do you want to come in? I mean, how did the relationship begin with them? Uh, it was Ross Chanley. Um, uh, mm -hmm. We got, we, me and Mick had Ross Chanley on the Cop Out podcast uh, once. And um, that, w that was it. it the, the relationship between me and Ross uh, went from there really to the point where 
you know, we've just, you know, we've both just left the company that we've been working with and we work together very closely for the, the past 18 months. And, you know, he's, he's one of my best friends in the world. And that's how it started really. And I think I was listening to one of Paul's podcasts with his dad and his dad had mentioned about his first Liverpool game that he ever went to. Um, and I had the program to it. So I messaged Paul saying, do you want the program for your dad? Cause I don't, if he's not got it, you know, you can have it. Um, and he said, yes, yeah. so I dropped it off at the studio and that's how I got introduced to Paul and, 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 and meeting Chris and stuff. And that was it. Just got asked to go on a show once. And I think if you're relatively okay on camera and relatively okay, as you know, Lou, you'll get asked to come back and, and that's, that's how it started. And then obviously when I started doing content creation and making documentaries and stuff like that, it was like Redmen have obviously put a bit of faith in me to do other bits. And obviously they knew I was working on the story of a crew. Um, cause obviously Paul's a, a, a big a big kit fanatic as well. So I asked Paul, would he be part of the documentary? Cause you know, good to get his insight on it. And, um, and yeah, so then it just, it's just all stemmed from that really mate. And it's just going backwards and forwards on shows and it's always a good laugh, isn't it? So. I mean, it, it is something that's very, you get your name out there as well by being a part of it. And I mean, obviously you're working with Patrick Berger now, but is there any other sort of surreal moments that have come about during your time in content creation that when you were younger, you just think, but they are like, I did not expect this to ever happen. Absolutely. Mate. I think, again, COVID was a, a little bit of a blessing for, for me in terms of interviews because, you know, the the, the names are, you know, sort of that I can ring off now in terms of interview, like, you know, Polo Zenden, Momo Sissoko, you know, uh, two of the highlights, Sander Vestervelde, oh my God, Marcus Babel um, was, if, you know, again, if you said to me, you're going to sit down and have an hour with all of those. I'd be like, no, nah, that's never going to happen. You know? So that was surreal. Um, Sean Dundee, you know, he, he's a lot of people, he's in a lot of people's worst 11s, but we've done like the only interview with Sean Dundee from a Liverpool perspective. And he told this story and it was one of our most popular interviews that we did because people were commenting going, do you know what? I never knew that. I didn't know this. He's actually really sound. You know, it changes the perspective of it. I think on his Twitter, he's still got our, as his, as his Twitter banner, he's still got the graphic that we made as his interview, which is which is pretty cool. Um, but then me and Mick always had a bucket list of people uh, that we wanted. And um, getting Jason McAteer and uh, Patrick Berger was just unreal. And for McAteer, you know, it wasn't just a generic interview that I did with him. We like, I was with him for, for like two hours. And we were talking about the 90s. And we were talking about footy kits and stuff and how boss football was in the 90s and just everything. So, yeah, so those are some of the surreal moments. It's just like, yeah, it, it just, just wouldn't happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I agree. And I, everyone's got, I've got my bucket list. John Arnarisa is like hop of that bucket list. I really want to speak to him at some point. Everyone make that happen, please. Um, <laughs> but it's like, it is just such a surreal thing. And I went to, obviously when you were younger, I want to go back a little bit. Where did the obsession, or I suppose obsession is the right word, technically, because you are like a retro <laughs> fan, but where did the obsession with kits come from? Like, you've talked about a crew being such a big part of your, of your, well, a big part of your life, essentially, because of what it's done for you, but sad, where really, did that stem from? Sad. sad. It's a sad life I lead. <laughs> it's not sad. I've got them on my, on my wall. It's not sad. You're fine. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 it's not sad liking kits, mate. It's I just meant like the, the obsession I have with, with a crew and everything about the colour <laughs> and the training grit. It's just, yeah, it's, it's weird. It's really weird. Um, it's a nice colour, though. It's, it is yeah, like... it is. It's it's it's, it's, it's a lovely colour, it, it is, to be fair. I, do you know what, mate? I can't I can't tell you where it is because I just, I've always been excited by the designs. You know, the first ever kit mm. I got bought for me was like the 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 candy kit with all the, 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 the white flakes on it and stuff, you know, so yeah, like yeah. 1989. Yeah. But and that was the first one that was bought for me as a photograph. But the first one I remember actually going out to the shop and buying uh, was the nineteen ninety three away, where it was like the the white Adidas one with the green sleeves and the the, the black Adidas stripes going up the side. You know that was my first one, and it was just the design of everything. And like I always had to have uh, the latest one. You know, God bless my parents for, for for buying it for me all the time. But it's just I was always excited by the new designs and what what they could do. And I always like looking back at if the kit manufacturer comes in, are they going to hark back to the, the past are they going to take a, de a past design and influence it into the new design and or are we going to get a completely new one that's going to set a mm. new trend and yeah. that's all all it was mate it was just like obsession of that all the time and 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 growing up with like different kits and then i started looking at 
what like I think Euro ninety six was just a boss area for footy kits. I just think like you know Italy's was gorgeous and the Czechs was gorgeous and England's was great. Um, and then World Cup ninety eight, France ninety eight with the Dutch top and the Brazil top with the Ronaldo on it. And you know it's just it just became a bit of an obsession. Then I, mean, I just love design. I love seeing what people can create and something new and. What I've always said, obviously, I'm a big Back to the Future fan. I know time travel doesn't exist, but when you look at a kit or you buy an album, right, and you listen to that album 20 years later, you are taken straight back to the moment you bought the album. Some certain smells will come back. You'll remember where you are, that type of thing. And it's the same with kits. You know, you, you, t- you look at a kit and you think, oh, I remember when I wore that or I remember that happening in it and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's just emotional memories, really, to be fair, mate. And I just like having a big box of memories, really. I completely agree. Like, I've got loads of kits in the back. I've got loads of Liverpool ones. And the certain ones from, like, when I was a kid, uh, I think the first year it was, like, it was the 2001. Um, it was, like, that gold uh, kit, the FA Cup final one, I believe it was. That was my first one as a kid. And Love that. It's, it is, like you said, it's, it's historical memories. Does the kit, like, the design of the kit, does that affect in a way how you look back at a season? So, like, for example... 19 uh, 2019 2020 we win the league it's one of the happiest memories of my life but because i'm not overly keen on the kit i wasn't too much of a fan of the sort of stripes it has a bit of a dampener on it ever so slightly is that the same sort of thing for you do you know what i totally agree where you're coming from there i really really do because when the, the kit we won the champions league in in madrid don't like it at all I don't I don't like oh, it. Oh really? Yeah, I just I just was never a fan of it from day one. I bought it obviously mm. to collect and I've you know oh, thanks, yeah. I, I've got it signed by Roy Evans now which is obviously a treasured me- a treasured memory. Um but I don't like it. Yeah, I I, I just think mm. oh, wish we could have lifted that in a different one. You know, and like in Istanbul I wasn't a fan of lifting the trophy in that. But if we'd lifted the trophy in 2007 Athens in the Adidas one, I'd be like, yeah, now that's a picture. So I, I totally agree, mate, I do. And But, you know, the the, the kit that's behind you, uh, Nike's first iteration of a Liverpool mm-hmm. shirt, people look at that kit and they absolutely hate it because of the season we had. And it was a very, very poor season. But I still like it as a kit, so I would still wear that. But then there's a part of me that wears it and they go, I might have the gold badges on it, but ugh, we had a horrible season in it. Yeah. But Alisson did yeah. score a goal in it. So there's always like a little pocket of memories. So I, I agree, mate. You know, sometimes it puts a damper on it because you don't like it. But um, yeah, no. But no, the 1920 kit I absolutely love because it was a hack back to to Paisley in 1984. So yeah, it was uh, it was good. It was. I just there was something about the stripes. I just I was looking at it and I was like, it's 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 nice, but I don't know what I was expecting to be honest. I think I was such a big fan of the kit the season before the Champions League one because it was quite mm. simplistic. It just sort see how see the difference that is out. between two seasons. You prefer that one, and I don't like it. And you don't like the yeah. one I like it. See, and that's that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of conversation, and that's the beauty of kit collecting. Have you got a least favorite Liverpool kit? Oh yeah. Oh right, it is. And again, it goes back to a little bit of the the, the time period. Um, I don't like the Adidas kit. The last year we we wore Adidas. So um, FA Cup final twenty twelve, Carling Cup final twenty twelve kit. Mm. It was like a really tight collar with the Adidas stripes down the down the the, yeah. the edges. I don't like because I think it, the the material's too silky and the material it was dead shiny. So for me, it just didn't it didn't look right and it didn't sit right and. I, I didn't buy that one. I still don't own that kit. I don't know if it's because of my brain, I won't buy it, but I still don't own it. So yeah, that's probably my least favorite home shirt out, out of out of everything. I'm just doing a quick glance at my brain now. Yeah, definitely uh, not a fan of that one. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of the, uh, I think it was the 13, 14. It was the away kit where it was that weird, like, oh yeah, three part patch one. And I, I just did not like that one at all. No, and it, I, it, you know, yeah. The, like, the funny it, thing is about just, that, the, things like the, that. The 13 14 season home shirt was absolutely beautiful. Loved it. Yeah, yeah. And it was, was stunned. But the two away kits, the white one with the, the, the flex and then the purple and black and white one, and it was awful. Absolutely. I don't know what Warrior were playing at because they got the home one spot on uh, and they got the home one the previous season spot on as well, where it was just red. And they were the first ones to bring back the Liver Bird, which Reebok wanted to do, by the way. Um, yeah. So um, I agree with you. Those away kits are horrible. They're probably the more worst away kits. What did you think of um, New Balance when they were in when they were in charge of the kits? I thought they did a brilliant job, mate. I thought they did, and do you know yeah. why? Because they weren't templates. They weren't templated uh, designs. They were they were pretty much unique to every club. 
you know, I know they had Celtic and they had Porto at the time as well. So they did really well. And I was really impressed with New Balance from the start. I mean, I know obviously they, they took over from Warrior and they were subsidiary. But even Warrior, I think Warrior from a home perspective did quite well. But New Balance just took it up a level. And I thought, yeah, New Balance did uh, did really well with with all three uh, designs for home away and third. I mean, just to keep it on the kits for the last one, like when it comes to a design for you, are you a lot more, you like the sort of, loud flamboyant type of kit something that really sort of stands out or do you like the sort of more simplistic as long as it's a good color and just looks respectable that's fine like it doesn't have to be too flash if that makes sense yeah i'm definitely in that camp mate I, that's probably my old head on it because i think the simpler the better um don't get me wrong i think you know you, you you throw a little bit of jazziness in there and it can work i mean when i first saw the 21 22 where it had sort of like the, the jazzy little lines across and had sort of like a, an orange neckline mm-hmm. sort of um, diagonal if, yeah yeah i mean i even said in my first review of that i was like it's not a bit of me that but it grew on me you know because mm. the team were making memories in it i mean don't get me wrong the away kit that season was just the pinnacle for me because they re they re-brought back a crew so i was i was i was happy with that um so but yeah it did it, it, it grew it did grow on me um so it I, I i'm all for a manufacturer coming with a completely new design because not every season does a kit have to hack back to 1997 or 1996 or 1982 or whatever sometimes you need a fresh design so that in 2050 whoever's manufacturing then can go we'll do 2024 2025's new design do you know what i mean so it's like, oh i remember that 20 and we're having the same conversation it's the same cycle you've always got to refresh it but i always go back to what peter moore said to me in the story of a crew when Reebok came in they wanted to design something that wasn't just about wearing it on the stands on a Saturday. It was something you could wear with your jeans and trainers on a Tuesday night in the pub. And for me, that's exactly what the accrued shirt did. And you'd saw that quite a bit in the nineties uh, and people that are around that time will, will, will agree with me on that one. So for me, the simpler, the better. I don't mind a little bit of jazziness and stuff like that, as long as it doesn't take away from, you know, you can get away with it with the third kit. Cause let's face it. The third kit is built for jazziness and the third kit is built for the kids who want the, the, crazy colors um i i don't know who invented that that kit we had last year the, the white one with like all the purple and blues and weird swirls that was all over it it was like I mean, a hip, hypnotizing thing i own that one i won't lie to you <laughs> i've got quite i kind of didn't that's mind the that collection. If you, that's the collection that's what i mean but again it's di- different taste in it but it's yeah, an away yeah. shirt so you can sort of get away with it a little bit but mm. i'd say save the craziness for the third kit and try and just keep the the home and away as simple as you can and i always say like our away kit a first week has to be yellow, green, or white every year without 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 a shadow without one of those three colours because that's traditional. Uh, well, yellow as well, you know. So it's uh, so yeah. I, the simpler the better for me in the short answer. That's fine, mate. Go in as as in depth as you want because out of that, I remember, like I love the yellow kits. I absolutely love yellow, like in a football shirt. I don't know what it is. I think it might just be the, the standoutness of it. It just it looks on a on a sunny Saturday when we're playing football, like in the afternoon. And the light shining off it, it's just such a beautiful sight. It's, it's so no. right, mate. It's so right. Yeah. I mean, like, but moving on, like, sort of into the next question, but sort of keeping it in the same theme. Like, you mentioned there that kits are very often nowadays, they're a throwback to a, a previous mm. time. Yeah. Well, considering how far football is looking into the future with, like, VAR and all these new rules and finance regulations coming in, is there a sort of strange opposite in terms of, kits have to hark back to the past whereas every other aspect of football is trying to move forward oh do you know what it's it, i think a lot it's such a good question that mate because i think manufacturers now they get panicked on making something that is fresh because of because of how expensive fo- footy kits are nowadays <clears throat> excuse me and they don't want to make something that's going to be too outrageous where they put a lot of money into the investment the time and making the kit and then all of a sudden it doesn't sell you know, you've 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 dropped, you've you fell off the cliff there, haven't you? So I think there is a bit of pressure from these manufacturers to make sure that there is a tie-in from the older generation, so it might entice them to buy it. All buy one, and I'll buy one for my son because I'm a I'm a stickler for that. Like I've got to buy a matching kit for me and my lad. However, most of the time, what I'm doing now is I'm putting it in retro kits. So you mentioned the gold one from the the you know the the 2001 2002 away shirt. Uh, sorry, 2000 to 2001 away shirt. He's got that now in a child size that I found on Vinted. It's got Heskey number eight on the back of it. So that is, you know, 20 odd years old. And every day he gets, can I wear my Heskey shirt? Can I wear my Heskey shirt? And he loves it. You know, so it's it it's still 
the manufacturers that have to cater for three different generations, it seems nowadays. And that's, that's a lot of pressure. Um, so I still think that every year you'll always get something where it's like, it represents this, or this is the colour of the Liver building. I remember that a couple of years ago, you know, that's the colour blue from the Liver Bears. It's any little bit of marketing they can jump onto to make it sell. And I get that. I do get it. But sometimes it's a bit like you're clutching at straws there, mate. <laughs> you're looking for some sort of like market employee that's going to make people go, yeah, I love that. Yeah, that exactly. makes part of part of Liverpool culture, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, we'll go we'll go then from the past. The DeLorean's coming back to modern day now. We're going to go over <laughs> Liverpool. And I suppose the current season they're having, we're by all means punching above expectations. We've just thrashed Chelsea with a bunch of kids. I mean, what do you make of the current season so far in terms of what you were expecting going into this campaign? Uh, we said this on Sunday after after we we, we left the ground on Sunday and we, we, we went to the torch and had a, had a pint before we went back to our hotel. And we were saying like, if you'd said to us at the end of last season that this is where we'd be, you'd have, you'd have bit your hands off it. You know, even with the injuries, we, we said like, you know, would you take it with these injuries? And we're like, yeah, absolutely, you take it. I, I, you said, you summed it up perfectly before, Lou. It's um, surprising. You know, I, I, after the season we had last year, I just didn't expect us to be where we are. So that's why I'm saving it. That's why I'm enjoying it. You know, I'm not moaning about every week there's another in. Well, I mean, obviously I'm moaning about it. Of course, you wouldn't be human if you wasn't. But I'm not moaning at anybody in particular. I'm just like, yeah, it's a crap situation. But I'm so grateful for us to be in this position. You know, it's the, it's the end of February as we record this. I'm still in four competitions. We've just picked up our first trophy of the season. You just got to enjoy it, man. This is this is a ride that doesn't come about very often. And we said this two years ago. So I'm like going the match every week and planning trips to Wembley and stuff. And I said to me, missus, just let it happen because it's going to be a while before this ever happens again. And trying to explain it to her just after Christmas that I could be going all the time and for four competitions it was an eye-opening conversation i'll tell you that right now so that's why you've got to enjoy it because it doesn't come around that often <laughs> so just enjoy it no it doesn't it absolutely doesn't and you know what i think that's the message that a lot of people at the moment seem to be there's a sort of nervousness people some people are enjoying it but at the same time some people are looking at it with a sort of bleak optimism that yes you know it's all great at the moment but then there's an end to the ride in sight with clock obviously right, even at the end of the so. season and rightly so mate. rightly yeah. so Definitely. I mean, like, while enjoying it's one thing, is there a sort of sense of nervousness for you, for, from you, for what comes after the end of the season? Oh, 100%, mate. 100%. I, I, I'm usually the type of person that uh, goes for a number two every two or three days. You know, that's that's me. But the long, the closer we get to the end of the season, I'll probably be going every day. Um, I am, I am really nervous because... I am and I'm not, and I'll explain this. And what I mean by this is, um, moving on from Jurgen Klopp is, I don't know how anyone can follow it. You know, similar when you know Jose left Chelsea or Ferguson left United, it's hard to follow in those footsteps, especially in the Premier League era. But don't forget, this club has done it before when we were in the pits and Shankly came in, dragged the club up, reinvented the training ground dragged us by the scruff of the neck to league titles and FA Cups and European trophies. And he had us in a place where we were ready to conquer, where he just said to the next person, there you go. And that person ended up being Bob Paisley, who just completely transferred the club another way. But he's the exact opposite to Shanks. He's cool, calm and collected, not as loud and just does his job. We don't need the next Klopp. We don't need the next Shankly. We need the next Paisley. The next person who's going to take what, what Klopp has done brought the club back to where it needs to be, redeveloped the training regime. We've got a new training ground. Everything is set perfectly for that, that person to step in and just go, right, I can do my job without worrying about the rest of it. So shanks to Paisley, clop to whoever that's going to be. That's how it works. I mean, is there an argument to say that there's more stress for whoever comes in after Klopp than there was when Klopp was coming in after Brendan Rodgers because there was a sort of when Klopp was coming in we knew what was possible but if we didn't achieve it it was like well this is no different than what we have achieved whereas now like you said we're top of the mountain mm -hmm. is there more risk for whoever comes in now as opposed to when Klopp came in back then given that we could drop yeah absolutely and I think that's the thing that makes us a lot you know a lot of us nervous because we just think well you, you, when you're at the top, there's only one way one way to go, isn't there? And um, Manchester United know that better than anybody. They win the league, the manager leaves, and they've not won it since. So, you know, touch wood, that doesn't happen. 
Um, but yeah, mate, there's, there's, there's that nervousness because, you know, you've got this group of players that have been used to one man for such a long time and the way he does things. And is that is that next manager going to come in and, and be similar? You know, the, the backroom staff aren't staying either. So again, it's just change all. The, the, this, it's a fresh thing. It's like when you start a new job. You know, you go into a new territory and you're like, oh, I'm not used to this. Oh, this isn't weird. But people are adaptable. At the end of the day, it's the same football. It's the same size pitch. It's the same amount of players on the pitch. You go and get your job done and you do it. Sounds simple to me saying that. But I'd, again, it goes back to what Klopp's done and the ethos and the atmosphere around the club. All the staff are still there. You know, in, not the immediate backroom staff, but a lot of the staff will still be there. So there's still a lot of sort of comfort for the players. Um, and again, this will be a testament to the to the club is as long as they get the right man in charge, everything will fall into place. But there's, there, is a, there is a nervousness about it. No, definitely. And you are right in what you're saying. I think Klopp's leaving it at the right time because he's leaving, like he said himself, not because he wants to, but because he has to, because he knows he can't give 100%. So mm -hmm. like he said, we are in a great position for whoever comes in and takes over. Now, we're going to come back to this shortly, but I just want to get your perspective from, from a filmmaker perspective, from content creator's perspective. What do you make of this documentary series coming in now? And like, what style of documentary would you like to see produced at the end of the season? Would you rather a sort of all or nothing style of series? Or would you rather something like, maybe not the best example, but like being Liverpool was back then? Like, you know, what would you, yeah, I know, I know. But it, we just that that kind of style thing. What would you like to see as a filmmaker? Well, definitely, out of those two choices, definitely uh, more of an all or nothing uh, type feel. Um, the BBC did a very good documentary called "A Thirty Year Wait" after uh, we'd after we'd won the league. Mm. Um, that that was really good. They did that sort of the preseason of, of the following year. So that that was really good. That was that was handled well. Um, you know, I've got to give credit to All or Nothing. They do a lot of good things. You know, I did enjoy the Man City one especially the episode where we beat them in the Champions League. That was really good. Um, you know, watched them all miserable. Um, is it Rakuten did one with Barcelona and they covered the, uh, the, the, the infamous corner taking quickly game again, you know, very good piece of filmmaking. Um, so yeah, good. I would probably more like the all or nothing style um, where you, you are seeing, you know, what's going on in the changing rooms and that sort of thing. And like when Tottenham, you know, they're having conversations about, transfers and stuff like that i do like that but i also understand the need for privacy as well and liverpool football club has always been a private club we've all we've never done things out in the open so it's very strange that we are doing this um i understood why we did it um for being liverpool because we had american owners and they wanted to grow the brand and that was a perfect way to grow the brand because it was made by americans it wasn't made by english you know getting a big hollywood star clive owen who you know, British and that was a Liverpool fan, but it was centered around America, you know, a lot of time in, in Boston and the Red Sox to cater to that audience. And it was like, it was like sucking eggs really, because they were trying to explain the rules a little bit. And, you know, it was a bit, a bit pulling teeth of who certain players were. And, you know, some of the players felt a bit wooden. Um, but I think, you know, you've got to look at Welcome to Wrexham. I think that's, that's one that I yeah. would personally love because I think the personality of what Rob and Ryan are, of what they do for the club is, similar to what the way Klopp is in terms of his funny personality you know you just got to look at Klopp's interviews and the brain fog incident and all that sort of stuff and I'd prefer that type of but again with Welcome to Wrexham they do a lot of thing where the, you know they're splitting down right well what does what's that British football saying they translate it to American and all that so it's not going to be like that because I do think that this is going to cater for a, a big British audience anyway um, mm -hmm. but it could be the greatest thing ever mate depending on how this season goes and what a way to for everyone to to buy it or stream it to to look back and this could be a, a, an incredible season. So at first I was a bit like, no, oh, I don't want to do another B in Liverpool. But right now, mate, I'm I'm quite excited by the prospect of it from a filmmaker's perspective. But I mean, yeah, as as time's going on and things are progressing, it does seem like there's a lot more optimism around it. And I suppose from a business perspective, it makes a lot of sense given that Klopp's so widely regarded, not just by Liverpool fans, but by football fans in general. So you're going to get a lot of people watching it who you wouldn't necessarily expect to. Now, sort of just going back onto the season then, like we've touched briefly on obviously Klopp's going to be leaving. What kind of impact do you see this having on the remainder of the season? We've obviously won the Cup, which is fantastic, but like we've still got City to play. We're still in a tightly competitive league. Do you think there's going to be more negatives before the end, or do you think that it could be onwards and upwards from here? Um, well, to be fair, I think we've had our answer to that already. I think we, when he announced it, we were all very worried about what it'd be like, and it just seems like the lads have just got a, a bit of an uplift in terms of yeah. the way they've been playing, or you could say they've just been going about the the, the, the games normally because they've just been winning and they're, they're still top of the league, but 
there's now a season pre Klopp announcement and post Klopp announcement. They're two completely different seasons now. That's when the season split. Yeah. So I think it's been a, I think it's been clever because I think it's sort of like we've got to do it for Klopp now. We've got to give it our all to the end because up until that point the boys were just like oh we'll have him next year and we'll try again next year you know so it, it's it's been quite clever um and i think it was definitely the right thing to do is to announce it early-ish in the season to give i think it's just going to give us that lift now and i think everybody wants it as well it's sort of reminded me of when you know uh leicester went top of the league at christmas and it was like can they do it and it was all about that and ev- i think everyone was willing it to to happen i think a lot of people secretly have been willing this to happen for Klopp to to win at least a, a couple more trophies you know hopefully he'll, he'll win the league with it um just to give it that that, that fairy tale send off and i I, th- I just think it's, it'll be a positive towards now and the end because you can see even from sunday you know that that five to eight minutes in the ground of where we're singing la 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 was just, you know, I've not had goosebumps like that since I was, um, since he never walked alone at Barcelona. You know what I mean? It's, it, it was crazy. It was, it was crazy to be part of it. And I just think like, we were all getting behind this team and Klopp is just so happy and everyone's just got this togetherness that, you know, you need in times like this to, to be going fighting on all four fronts. Well, you mentioned there, like the togetherness and the willingness from everyone. And that brings me on to the next point, actually. I wanted to touch on, as they've now been called Klopp's kids, like cop <laughs> kids as well, like, what he's done with that remark with that young squad is nothing short of remarkable and the fact that whoever comes in next not only has this prop of talented players in the first team but this young academy coming up Mm. i mean is there a a world to say that these kids are playing as well as they are because there's a sense of we're not going to get to play under jürgen klopp ever again so we've got to seize it now while we can so to speak Probably, mate. Yeah, I agree with that. I think Lee Clark, um, obviously the, the 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 father of Bobby, um, Lee Clark. A lot of people remember him for collecting uh, that man's sticker for for Newcastle back in the day. Um, he was he did an interview the other day about obviously how proud he was of his, of his lad. Um, but they were asking him about Klopp, and he said he said the the setup at Liverpool is absolutely incredible, and he's the catalyst for it. He said we were all gutted that he was leaving. You know, you think from a parent's point of view, it doesn't matter because your kid's still playing for the for the club and the infrastructure, but they were all genuinely gutted that he's going because he just brings so much to it. And people took the mick out of Klopp straight away for, for hugging his players and stuff like that. But you see so many managers that have copied his style and what he does, and it just shows that it works. So I, I think that these players are just so privileged to play for that man, and he'll be like, it's like the way um, how highly Steven Gerrard speaks of Gerrard Houllier and you know, give him, giving him his, his debut, and Jamie Carragher speaks very highly of Roy Evans. You know, They might not have played for them for a long time, but or had the best years under them, but they're still talked about. You know, you, you look at Steve Highway, you know, and it, it's th- those those influences on those young ages is is so, is so important, and, and Klopp's no no different. No, absolutely, and he's someone who I think a lot of the young lads have said it. He's an influential part not only on their football lives but their actual lives. He's developing them into men and yeah. turning them into like fantastic players. Of all these young lads coming through, and not to discourage any of them whatsoever, because they can all have fantastic futures, but is there any that you're looking at in particular and thinking you could be the next Trent, you could be the next, just example, Gerard, you could be the ones who could stick in this team for a long time going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I would have always said Connor Bradley for a start, because, but I watched a lot of Connor Bradley at Bolton. Um, and that was yeah. only because me, uh, my brother in law is a season ticket holder at Bolton. So every every week he's going, right. this kid's amazing, this kid's amazing. So I'm like, you know, I'm watching the games uh, while he's at the ground and stuff. And it, yeah, Connor Bradley is, is has exceeded so many people's expectations. And you've only got to search Connor Bradley in Twitter and look back when we weren't buying a right back for to back up Trent and the amount of people that were giving a bit of jib and saying we were a nothing club for not for not investing. Well, you know, it just shows that the people in the in the know know what they're talking about you know so uh yeah definitely Connor Bradley uh McConnell I think he's I think he's brilliant I think when he comes on and he sort of like he does dominate those uh those midfield areas I do I do really really like him um so for me he's he's the one that I'm really enjoying watching at the minute but you know Sunday was the first proper look I got at Dan's up front and again he was putting himself about yeah. and he's got a bit of pace on him and I was gutted because I really thought he'd scored at one point when he just tipped it over the bar so mm. uh, I think we'll see some of those um, those players a lot more before the season finishes. You know, hopefully not in the circumstances that we we have at the minute in terms of the injuries. But you know, th- th- I'm now relaxed if they come on. Do you know what I mean? I- I'm relaxed about it because you know what they're about and they're getting that. And like Bobby Clark as well, he's had so many uh, opportunities and he's he's, t- he's taking it with both hands. So those those are the, the few at the minute that I'm really looking looking forward to to, to seeing more of. 
Yeah, definitely. And um, you mentioned there, this is, it goes into the next one, actually. You mentioned there the investment and people were giving us a lot of jip saying, you know, nothing club, not spending money, not doing this. And it's a question I ask everyone who comes on because I feel like you get a lot of varying perspectives. What do you think uh, with regards to how FSG have managed their time at Liverpool? Like, I'm very much in the camp of there are points where I wish maybe we'd spend more, but at the same time, they've built such a sustainable future for the club that I am not under nervous threat of being like a Man United where they're in debt or a Chelsea where they're breaching rules or a Barcelona where they're having to sell parts of the club. Like, mm. what do you make of their time and can you understand why people perhaps are against it if you're for it, for example? Yeah, I, I can completely understand both sides of the argument. And to be fair, I've been on both sides a few times, not completely FSG in and completely FSG out. I'm more of, I look at where the club was before they came in and we're on the brink of administration and I look where we are now. Yeah. And if you'd said to me then that we're going to get American owners again, I'd be like, oh, no, I don't want Americans again. And I didn't. I didn't I didn't want Americans again after Hicks and Gillette because I just didn't. But if you'd have said to me that, no, these guys are going to come in and they're going to do X, Y, and Z. We're going to do this, this, and this. And, you know, again, time traveling, I know in the future, I'd have been like, get them in. Get them in, get them in, get them in. I think because of the way social media is at the minute and the way... I think a lot of the language speak of football now is is likened to football manager and it's likened to fantasy football, Premier League, and it's likened to EA Sports, FC, or whatever they call it these days. It's the same as that. You know what I mean? That's all. That all comes into play a little bit. And again, I would love for us to spend the way Chelsea do, Manchester United do, City do. Everybody would. I'd love a hundred million hundred million pound player every year, but it's not sustainable the way we are and the way we do business. And it's very rare we get a transfer wrong. If you look at FSG's model, it's very rare we've got a transfer wrong, especially under Jurgen Klopp. You know, all right, we, we, we'll say we didn't spend the Suarez money very, very smartly. Um, but since Klopp's come in and his backroom staff, we've we've spent wisely and relatively every player has done really, really well by Karius and Gruwich, you could say. Um, so, I mean, I look at FSG and I go, yeah, they could probably spend a bit more money, um, 100%. You know, but I don't think they could spend more money where it would have made us win a league title. And what I mean by that, and you know, God knows that'll get clipped and I'll get a load of hassle for it. But what I mean by that, mate, is we lost the league by 11 millimetres of the ball crossing the line in the Etihad. Or, or, you know, and that was the only game we lost that season, beaten by a point. Mm -hmm. We lost the league um, for, you know, drawing against Tottenham at 2-2 in, in, in 2022 you know it, we lost the league by a point then on you know on the final day we were we were 15 minutes away from winning the league by Steven Gerrard substitution Coutinho and then all of a sudden Aston Villa capitulate you know what I mean it, it's it's just crazy little things like that you know stuff that out of our hands a little bit and you could say yeah well if we had this better defensive midfielder you could have stopped that goal and yeah it's all hindsight and ifs and buts but you know yeah those extra players, you know, you, you never know what they'd do. So, yeah, I would love an extra 50 to 100 million pound player every summer. It doesn't work. I think, I do think Klopp's been very frustrated with the with the lack of budget, I must admit, you know, for the targets that he's, that he's had. I think we've we've had the opportunity to go and get Jude Bellingham twice and we didn't do it. Um, I think probably non-Champions non League football circumstances, it was a hindrance to that, especially when we just went, can I say it, 100 million? Yeah, there you go. You can have, we, we, we'll do that, no problem. And it, we had the money, so I do think there's an element of, of frustration, especially from us. So I, I, you know, but again, would I rather be in our situation or cities where I'm supporting a club where everybody else doesn't appreciate what we're doing because there's an asterisk, there's 115 asterisk, asterisk above it, or Chelsea's way of eight-year NFL-style contracts, you know, or United's where everything's just falling apart and they get everything wrong. Sign me up for FSG all day in that in that respective, but you know I do think they could have put more into the transfer kitty. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's a fair like that. That's probably the best way of looking at it. I, there's no sort of they're not perfect. They're not completely awful. It is, it is a sort of middle ground. No, exactly. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like no owner is completely to them. It's a business, and yeah. if they're making they're money and fans. clubs making money, no, exactly. And you mentioned there that. Klopp has obviously played a big part in the success. And we're, obviously, we're looking at a new manager coming in. There's talks of mm. Alonso, Ruben Amarim, Deserby, yeah. Thomas Frank, etc. Is such an important part of picking our manager someone who can work in the FSG model of sort of you've got to sell to make money and we have to be a bit yeah. more a bit more tactical with our spending? 
Yeah, exactly, mate. And this is where, you know, the whole Klopp performing miracles is, is, a, is a tweet that I see so many times over the last five years. You know, mm. if FSG didn't have Klopp, it's Klopp performing miracles, it's Klopp performing miracles. Klopp's a very, very good manager, and we'll find that out, won't we? Because the say say this team, Touchwood, goes on to win the, the, the so-called quadruple, or it wins the league. Let's just set the league, because that's all mm. what, what we want. And then next year, we completely capitulate. It'll be... There you go. FSG didn't invest. Klopp did perform a miracle. But Klopp also fell off in 2021 when, after we won the league. Yes, we were decimated by injuries again, but, you know, but it was the narrative of, well, they've not given Klopp any money. You know, there was the whole t- sign Tiago thing and it wasn't happening. Then it did happen. Then we got Jota 24 hours later. You know, so it was like from one end of the scale to the other. Um, worst time of my life that when, when Tiago signed with the building, the amount of abuse I got, it was horrible. Oh, um, honestly. And, but when you look at it now and you go, there could be an, another manager that comes in who completely just takes it and does what we said earlier and paisley and does a paisley and just takes it to the next level. You're not gonna know. But that manager who comes in will have to have experience. Now, if Al- Alonso is that man, then Bayer Leverkusen have a very similar model. They don't just spend, 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 spend. They spend what they earn, speculate to accumulate, that type of thing. So he'll be used to it. Um, and he'll know what he'll know going into it. Any manager will know what going into it, you know, with the job interview and stuff. So it'll be interesting, mate. It really will. Um, and I think I just hope it doesn't divide the fan base because that's that's the thing that I hate the most about all this. It just it divides everybody, and everyone's ar- argues with each other about it. And it's such a toxic place that it shouldn't be. We should be celebrating this era and this period that we're in. Um, and everybody should just be friends and rainbows and all that sort of stuff. But it doesn't. It divides opinion. And football should. But it shouldn't divide it to the level of abuse that a lot of people get for certain for saying certain things and having certain opinions. Yeah, absolutely. Especially on Twitter, where it's quite a, a volatile place, I suppose, at points. Now, I've got one more question, and then I've got a bit of a fun exercise, I suppose you can call it, towards the end. So I just want to get your thoughts with regards to, I ask everyone the same sort of thing, but Darwin Nunez, we, we've spoke very passionately on Darwin Nunez. I'm very, very pro-Darwin, as I've shown on Red Men. Can you what what do you think is the best position for Nunez to be playing in? Is he that out and out striker that we're looking for, or is he better on the wing, like as a sort of free Roman, you do what you want kind of player? What's the best way to tame Nunez? Darwin's best position is just on the pitch. As long as he's on the on the pitch, he's making a bloody nuisance of himself, and I'm fine with that. Get that ponytail on that pitch and just annoy people, annoy the frig out of everybody. I don't care. I definitely think central um, is is his mm. best position because he likes to play off the shoulder, but he's so good on, on, on the wing as well because he just likes driving. He likes driving at people and taking them on. It's just that you think you've got this train of Darwin Nunes. You don't know where he's going to go. He's a bit nuts. He's, he's sort of like a little bit of a of a hybrid of Torres, the way he moves, and Suarez in terms of his, his unpredictability. The just thing he's missing from Torres is, 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 is his goal scoring, you know what I mean? Because I do think he's you know he's got that in his locker. We, we saw that for Benfica. Um, but his goal contributions, you know, I love the fact that that's coming to the game a bit more now in terms of the look at goal contributions. You know, I, I'm I'm a big fan of the NHL and they, they, they always add up goals and assists because they're just as important. And, you know, you look, Mo Salah doesn't score as many this season if it wasn't for Darwin Nunes. I was frustrated with him, don't get me wrong. I was like, I was annoyed at one point. I was like, I was annoyed that he was starting a while ago. You know, it was more towards the beginning of the season. I was getting really frustrated with him because you think you've got chances there that Jota could probably finish and he sat on the bench, you know. So it's frustrating. But now he's just become a bit of a cult hero. He's a little, he's a Liverpool icon at the minute. And when he's on the pitch, he makes things happen. And that just must must be the Uruguay in him because Suarez did that. You know, it, that's that for me. Just as long as he's on the pitch, mate, I don't care. I mean, yeah, I think that's the perfect answer. I, I I completely agree. Darwin just needs to be playing in anything. You mentioned the ponytails. As long as he's not doing that weird plat thing again, <laughs> I'm happy. I didn't quite like that. To be fair, mate, I, I would just love the opportunity. I'd love the opportunity to plat my hair, but I haven't got any. So for me, if it's a, pro- I'd love to have his problem of platting the hair. <laughs> but I know what you mean. <laughs> problem to have. It's like too much money. Oh, I, I mean... So we're going to move on then to the last part. It's the, it's the sort of the fun exercise, so to speak. I did this with Chris, and it seemed to go over really well. If you haven't seen that video, by the way, guys, please make sure you go back and check it out. Really, really enjoyable one that I did with Chris Pajak off Red Ben TV. Um, so I want you, Jay, to describe for me your perfect Anfield trip. I want you to describe what you're doing before the match, who we're playing, 
the kit, the songs being sung, everything, just your perfect Anfield trip that you would want. Oh, mate, oh, I can't wear the crew kit on, can we? Right, okay. Um, perfect Anfield trip for me is going to May Duncan's pub um, in Everton, uh, in off Everton Road, because um, I just love that pub. It's it's so accommodating. Pete, the landlord's just boss, um, so we have a right laugh in there. <laughs> so we go there, um, have a walk. To Anfield, it's about you know 10 15 minute walk, and we have a walk down uh, what we used to call uh, Mignolet Mile. Um, we're on, on Mia Bank, but we then renamed it to Carrier's Kilometer, and then now it's Allison Avenue now because we always, she's always talk about goalies and stuff like that. So, going down, having a walk down there, getting in the ground, we'll usually have like a, what, what me and the lads call a two minute bottle. So, if it's like just like 15 minutes before kickoff, we'll just go into into Dodds and have a two minute bottle and just uh, have, have the last one in there before we go in the ground. Go in the ground, um. Who are we playing? I would probably say, let's play Manchester United. Um, you know, I play play Manchester United or Everton, one of the two. You know, it's it's got to be the local derby. Um, for one of those, we batter them. You know, another seven nil or another five two against Everton, and singing singing every song from the songbook, but not rushing them because I, I I I feel like we tend to rush a lot of songs now just to try and get through them to get through to the next one. Whereas mm. some of the songs, if you sing a little bit slower, they sound a lot better. Like the Jurgen song, Jurgen is read it was a lot. I, I feel it was a little bit better. It was a little bit slower, but you know you got to get through them these days. And you know it's uh, you know the a, a, a bright sunny day would be good as well. Uh, you know that would, that that'd be class um, as long as the the atmosphere is good because I know and and you know nighttime is is much better atmosphere. So one of those two. Um, and then the, the exact reverse coming out, you know, back up uh, Allison Avenue, up uh, Mingyle Mile and uh, back into Mays and staying in there till closing. So that's the, as long as we get a Liverpool win. Uh, what kit are we wearing? Well, if I can't pick the Accru one, uh, then I'll pick the Reeboks 1997 to 1990, 1996 to 1998 home kit. I'll pick that one instead. That's great to me, to be honest. I mean, like when Chris was doing it, he was describing it, it sounds like a festival and it, it it basically is Anfield on match day is just like being at a festival. It's ridiculous what the atmosphere is like out and inside the stadium. I mean, the last one then. So I've got a few players. I want you to give me, it doesn't have to be one word. You can go in as much detail as you want or as little detail as you want. Just when I say the player, what comes to your mind? Sound good? Yeah, sounds good, so, mate. Sounds good. We've got, first and foremost, uh, I mentioned it before, but John Arnarisa. Ooh, um... Oh, I'm 50 50 with John Anarisa. Um, as a footballer, incredible left foot. Um, Manchester United comes comes to uh, comes to my head, uh, and yeah, um, yeah, one of the best left left backs we've had in 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 recent times. Before Andy Robertson really showed you how to be a left back. Yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, next one we've got Emil Heskey. Oh, my son's favourite at the minute, Emil Heskey. Um, do you know what, mate? Loved, loved Emil Esky. I thought he was um, underrated. Is probably the, the the word I'll use because he made Michael Owen. I think I, I don't think Michael Owen wins the Ballon d'Or without Emil Heskey by his side. That's the biggest compliment I can pay to Emil Heskey because he was vital when we signed him. Eyebrows were raised in in two thousand when we signed him, and he shown us in that treble year just just how good he was. So yeah, underrated. Very underrated goal scorer Emil Heskey. He was a very in terms of physicality, I, I can't think of many in the Premier League who have who are like as good as Heskey. He was a monster in terms of physicality. Um, next up, we've got Lazar Markovic. <laughs> I just think of being poked in the eye. Um, that's all I can think of. Um, <sighs> he had nice hair. That was it. That was about that was about it really. I was a bit I was a bit jealous of his hair because it was long. Um, a shame really because he was there for years and never lived up to his price tag at all. So. Yeah, just finger poke in the eye. That's that's all I think of with Lazar Makovic. Finger poke in the eye. Absolutely fine with me. Uh, next up, we've got Glenn Johnson. Oh, I was dead excited when we signed Glenn Johnson. I really thought he was one of the missing pieces of the puzzle. Um, when, like, 08, 09, when we nearly won the league, I thought, you know, getting that decent right back was, was great for us because he was so good going forward. He was a goal scoring right back as well. And I absolutely love Glenn Johnson. And yeah, I thought. Up until Trent, it was like, yeah, he was him and Finn and were like, so, like two right backs I just absolutely love. So, yeah, I, I think Glenn Johnson was brilliant. Loved him. For more then, so we've got, oh, if I can get my thing up, that'd be fantastic. We've got Lucas Labour. Oh, just a cult hero, mate. What one of the nicest men in footy. 
you'll you'll probably ever ever meet. He's just so sound. Um, and again, probably a little bit underrated, especially during the period. Like, I mean, he won, he won Player of the Year once for us, and that says everything because for a few good few years he was slagged off by a lot by many Liverpool supporters, which was a shame, really. But always played with a smile on his face. And I think the one word that everyone will think of with Lucas Leiva is Alegre. Alegre. <laughs> that video is up there. Like, that is one of the most legendary videos I've ever seen in my life. It's him in the fairground. Um, next up, we got three more. So, Peter Crouch. Oh, he's big, he's red, his feet stick out the bed. So happy when we signed Crouch here. I think, again, another another cult hero of Liverpool because he played with a smile on his mm-hmm. face and he had a bit of banter about him and he was he was really good. Um, I've got a very big soft spot for Peter Crouch and I told him this when when uh, when I met him um, and I was at the Wigan game when he scored his first ever goal and I, I always said there should have been t-shirts made then saying I was there when Crouch scored his first goal because it was such an anomaly that he hadn't scored for ages so yeah, yeah but he went on this just once he got that first goal he went he was just prolific he just went on that season of just yeah. scoring goal after goal after goal and I think he left too soon. I really do. I think um, I think we we could have had Peter Crouch for a lot longer. And um, yeah, I was gutted when he left. But yeah, I think Peter Crouch is uh, definitely a Liverpool legend and uh, not the, not the best player that's ever wore the number fifteen for Liverpool, but still a bloody good one. Well, I mean, yeah, I think I mean, yeah, I can't I've really really got anything else to say to that one. To be honest, it was <laughs> till the end. Um, two more, Yossi Ben Ayoun. Oh, another number fifteen. Um, Again, very, I was quite eyebrows raised when we signed him because I thought he was absolutely brilliant for West Ham. So I was really excited because I just loved his technical ability and the way he used to drop a shoulder and fake a shot or fake a pass and just go around people. I've, 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 it's very difficult to find someone who's, who was better than Yossi Ben Ayin to do that. And he came up with some amazing, amazing moments. You know, he, he was the man for the big occasion. And also as well, I think I might be right on this. But I think to this day, he's still the only Liverpool player who scored a hat-trick in the league, FA Cup and Champions League in the same season. Wow, I didn't even know that. That's mad. A bit of trivia. I might be wrong, but it, it was trivia a few years ago. So Mo Salah might have broke that now. But uh, as I'm thinking, that was that was the biggest thing. So yeah, lovely Yossi Ben Ayoun, great player. And then, oh, just one more thing before that. I mean, like Ben Ayoun, I look at him and think that he's a player who'd do very well in a Klopp system. 100%, mate. Definitely. Definitely. He clock and love a player like that. Yeah. And last cha- last one, and this is your chance to get a pay, ri- pay rise here, so make sure you take this one very well. Patrick Berger. Hero. Um, icon. Yeah. He just me, me, me hero growing up, mate. It was the left foot, it was a left foot, it was a left footed player that came in with a with a big reputation. And I was left foot and I played on the left wing as well. So it was it was that. But he yeah, he's just uh he's yeah, but it's it's weird now because of my mate. So I don't, I'm not uh, I'm not going to go too all, overboard about it because he, he 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 might see this and be like, "What the hell have you been saying?" Um, but no, mate. I think I go at the beginning. You just go this. Patrick Berger was not the. He won't get into many people's all time Liverpool 11s. You know, sadly, he didn't make that 50 documentary list we did uh, at Redmond. I think he came in like 71st. So, but he's still well regarded as a Liverpool legend because he always goes to Legends games and he always like as a smile on his face and he always speaks highly of the club and you know he came in it was it, it was his dream t- uh, club to play for so for me he's just he was a hero growing up and he always he always, he always will be um you know you, you look at it was it was Berger and Robbie Fowler for me growing up those, those were the two icons for me that were just like yeah so so yeah close to my heart uh, but again I can't go overboard because he might just I might get a WhatsApp message one day and just like what the f have you been saying you big girl so like that. so but yeah <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, I think that's the perfect answer. Can't go too overboard. Apparently, you can't give your mates too many compliments, otherwise they'll <laughs> laugh you off. But, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say a massive, massive thank you to Jay for coming on. Jay Pearson, if you haven't gone check it out already, please go check out the story of a crew on Redman TV, or Redman TV Plus even. It's such a fantastic piece of filmmaking. It really, really is. And go check out the Patrick Berger YouTube channel. Uh, videos are going up constantly. Make sure you follow Jay on Twitter, at Jimmy Cully. He'll keep you all updated with that. And if you want to see anything to do with retro retro kit, all things retro, to be honest, music, any great content, go follow him on Twitter. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching the latest episode of Expert Analysis. Please make sure to hit like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video. Jay, thank you very much for coming on, man. Thank you very much for having me, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.